All right, so yeah, thanks everyone for showing up. This is by far the biggest uh, turnout we've had for one of these calls. So uh, Dave, no, uh, no pressure, man. Um, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, um, yeah, this, yeah, we'll uh, get started with Dave. Uh, this photopolymer thing started a number of years ago. And the big problem was even the place where I bought the photopolymer film from, they wouldn't give you instructions. I would have to have a 600 mile round trip and um, about 250 pounds worth of, uh, uh, of tuition. Uh, so it was a case of filtering around, trying to find out for myself and it's stuff I've built up over the years um, through just fishing around books and, and internet. Uh, but I think we need to look at it from uh, the very beginnings where you've got the uh, the Chinese with woodblock printing and uh, woodblock engraving uh, used for new, uh, newspaper illustration uh, back in the late 1700s. And in 1822, we, as we most of us know, photography came about. An early photographer was introduced by, by Talbot and then perfected by this guy Carl Click. Um, largely replaced woodblock engraving for newspaper illustration in about 1880. So if we go to the next slide. And real quick, uh, uh, typically if, this... if, if any, everybody can uh, mute their microphone until uh, we have a question, that'd be great. Yeah, so, I mean, typically this was... Um, a wood engraving on, on a newspaper and um, you can see you would need artists who could work quickly and in fact some of these wood carvings that they, they use for illustration you might have two and three uh, guys working on it and it was all put, to, put together block and then printed so quite crude and, and um, you needed real artists working at this so the next one Typically, this was one of the very early photo reviewers. And it's uh, from the uh, newspaper, the graphic, uh, dated September 1885. You can see it's, it's very, very blocky. And it hadn't quite been, been perfected at, at that time, but certainly um, more accurate than, than a wood, wood block cut. Okay, next. These, these are beautiful things, they're um, uh, copper etchings, copper photographs, and I would love to have done them this way, but I'm too old, long in the tooth, and um, I don't think I've got enough time left to try and perfect these, but the actual, the plate on, on the left is absolutely beautiful with the detail in it, and then the image produced from the resultant, uh, uh, from the resultant print on the right hand side is um, is a real thing of beauty. Okay, next. So what are the differences basically? Photography, obviously we take a photograph and we have a continuous tone negative. That is blacks, greys through down to white, down to the paper white. We have a continuous um, we develop, develop and print, and then we have a continuous tone print. With photogravure, we take the photograph, we produce a positive, unlike um, conventional photography, and it's all turned around. Uh, obviously, when we're uh, printing a, a photograph, the longer you expose, the darker your print becomes. With um, photogravure, the longer you expose, the lighter your print becomes or the lighter plate becomes. So we make this um, half, what I call a half tone plate uh, from, from the positive. And once we have the plate, it's inked and it's run through an etching press. Okay, next one. The next slide, oh, that's it. Now back again, please. <laughs> I think you got me two there. That's it. No, that's the one. So your main pieces of equipment with your photopolymer gravure, 
This is the Toyobo plate type, which is a steel back plate. You need Photoshop for, for producing your, your negatives, or you can uh, produce sort of an 8 or 10 uh, conventional negative if you want. Um, printer to make a bit more positive. Clear acetate to print on your to Toyobo plate. Obviously, a UV exposure source, contact printing frame, water is used for developer with this uh, with this type of plate, etching press, etching paper, and ink. The difference with the photopolymer film is you've you've got to buy the film, plastic card which you laminate the film to. So um, with the Toyobo plate, your photopolymer is already laminated to a steel plate. With this, you make your own laminations. Ultrafine sandpaper, uh, hard roller, and sodium carbonate is your actual developer. You can use a thing called stochastic screen uh, and a continuous tone positive rather than bitmap positive. But we'll come on to that in, in a short while. Okay. This is your toy elbow. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, let me, let me interrupt real quick, Dave. R Renato, would you mind muting your microphone? Hello? Yes, would you mind muting your microphone? Yep. Awesome, thank you. All right, cool, thank you. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, um, this is your Toyobo plate. And the advantage is ready to use and it's got a metal backing, so it's very, very tough and you can make uh, quite a, a massive addition from it. And water is used to develop, so you've got no tox toxic stuff uh, around there. Disadvantage is it's around 18 to $20 US for an A4 plate. The metal back sheets are also a double-edged sword because you try to, to actually cut them yourself without a guillotine and you need a very precise, accurate guillotine to cut these things. If you try um, etch, you know, try a knife and scoring them or a scribe and bending them, you end up with a buckled plate. I've tried using a, an electric saw on them, you know, and. Uh, uh, the heat from the saw melts the uh, the plastics and the uh, photopolymers. So if you're going to use these things, uh, you need to, a guillotine as well to get them cut. Um, so this is why I tend to go for the, uh, the the photopolymer film rather than the Toyobo solar plate. Okay, next. Now this is your photopolymer film. And it is very, very thin. You wouldn't believe there are three, actually three layers to it. Top and bottom are um, protective layers and the center layer is the actual photopolymer, the active photopolymer film. The advantage is it's cheap, uh, one to two US dollars per laminated uh, A4 plate. And de developed in washing so soda, which is again, very, very cheap. Uh, Film has to be laminated, that's a disadvantage, but it's not that difficult um, when, when you uh, you'll see it on the following um, video. The only thing is you, you must take lots of care with dust. Now, I mentioned briefly before stochastic screens. Now, you'd use these with a continuous turn positive, uh, but again, it's a very expensive item. You, you know, you're looking at quite a lot of money for one of those things. So I tend to be mainly, we'll tend to mainly be looking at making the bitmap positive, laminating a photopolymer plate, developing and printing. Uh, I think, but first we need to understand the half tone positive. So if we go to the next one, for those who are familiar with half tones, you'll have to forgive me on this. Um, there may be some that are not, but continuous tone, as we said before, was black through greys, 
uh, down to your paper white. And that's what we, we print off on, on say an ink printer or, or what we print in the dark room conventionally. A half tone, you've only got two. You've got black of the ink and you've got white of the paper. So the problem becomes, how do we make shades of gray with only white paper and black ink? So here we look at the, um, the top half of the square of the rectangle is a continuous tone and the bottom half is actually a half tone, but it looks um, as though it runs from black through grays uh, down to white. Now, if we look at the, uh, the magnified red circle, you can see the black of the half tone, of the um, continuous tone and the gray of the continuous tone in the top two quadrants. Now in the bottom, you will see the black of the half tone and you'll see lots of little white dots in there. Now those are important and we'll come on to those later. In the second quadrant, um, you'll see it's mainly black with white dots. Onto the blue circle, we go to the other end of the spectrum and you can see the continuous tone gray and white and then the half tone, which is made up of the dots and of course the white paper. Okay. We go to the next. If we didn't have a, a half tone screen or a, a, a stochastic screen, the continuous tone positive on the left would, would actually, the plate would actually ink up and look something like this. Probably worse because the black areas would, would have uh, what you call open bite. And we'll look at open bite in a second or two. Okay. So the two ways of, of actually putting a dot matrix over the, uh, uh, over your print First way is a stochastic screen we've talked about. And it contains a ma matrix of black uh, and clear dots or shapes. It's used with a, a continuous tone positive and two exposures are required. First, the continuous tone positive is exposed and then the stochastic screen is exposed on top of it. And that, this lies down a white uh, matrix in the black and gray areas of the con continuous term positive, leaving the white areas unaltered. So we have a magnified view of a, a, a typical stochastic screen there. Okay, next. The second way is to make a bitmap positive. And Photoshop, we have uh, the con uh, on the bottom left, we can see the continuous tone uh, positive. You can have line screens like the second one along or cross screens. Uh, there's all manner of different ones you can pick out in Photoshop. But I like the, uh, the one on the far right, the diffusion dither. Uh, so that's my preference. Uh, next one. So if we start off with um, the continuous tone and we look to the next um, slide. On the left, you can see the image is broken down into, into black and white dots by turning it into a bitmap image used in Photoshop. When viewed normally, the eyes fall into a continuous tone. On the right hand side, the magnified eye, you can see the continuous tone of blacks, whites and greys. On the next slide, we'll have a closer look at the um, half tone shows up quite small on on this um, screen but you will see lots of little dots on the bigger picture and as the as the image gets smaller this is where your eyes fall into seeing the continuous tone and it is all just black and white dots okay so the steps, we make a bitmap positive, first of all. Then we laminate the photopolymer film to the base plate. Then when the plate's developed and dried, we ink the plate and then off it goes to the, uh, the etching press. Next one.
Okay. Okay. Sorry about that, Dave. I don't know why that started up. So <laughs> go <laughs> proceed. Yeah, if you go to the next one. So figure one, this is a piece of the photopolymer, if you like, magnified up. So you've got protective layers top bottom and the active photopolymer in the center. On the right hand side, you've got the plastic card. This is what you laminate to to give you the uh, the solid more solid base and what we have to do with the plastic card is sandpaper the very fine uh, sandpaper then we clean it with with alcohol to make sure there's not the slightest bit of grease on the plate otherwise the photopolymer won't stick so once that's dried off figure three we spritz the the, the plastic card with water and peel off the bottom of the protective layer on figure four. Then this is placed on top of the plastic card uh, and the water allows you to just move it around a little bit easier. It acts as, as if you like a lubricant so you can just push your photopolymer around into place. And then finally you roll it. Sorry, can you, that's it. Um, you, you roll it with a, um, a roller, get all the water and get the air out and then use a hairdryer or a drying cabinet, but be careful not to use too hot an air dryer because you can actually melt the, or not melt, but buckle it uh, and deform the uh, uh, plastic card that, that holds the photopolymer, okay? So typically we've, when we come to expose it, we've got the normal sort of thing, the, the printing frame, the photopolymer and plastic card sandwich, uh, the bitmap positive on top, and the printing, the glass printing frame. Now you'll note that the um, the top protection layer is still in place on the photopolymer, and that's kept there because if you don't have that there, you you uh, positive will actually stick to the photopolymer. Uh, so you just keep that in place until you're ready to develop. Next one. Uh, it's typical, this is my exposure device that you use. I use an Osram um, Ultra Vitalox lamp. I prefer this to the, uh, I've got flycatcher uh, tubes, which I use for cyanotype and um, oil printing. But I just find this, this a little bit better because it's more of a point source, point light source, and it makes the image a little bit crisper, I've found. Okay, next. Uh, and that's just typically the, the, the exposure unit doing its stuff. Okay. So after we've exposed our plate, we now take off the uh, top layer of, of the uh, photopolymer. So now we're left with plastic card and the active layer and we're ready to develop. So on the next one, we look at uh, yeah okay. So the top um, illustration, we've got the plastic card base again, the photopolymer, and the bitmap positive. Now the UV penetrates through the clear white areas, which is shown on on this, um, and it hardens the photopolymer below. Where the UV doesn't penetrate, uh, the photopolymer re remains soft. So when we go through the developer, which is a 1% solution of sodium carbonate, that area that hasn't been hardened is etched away. And that's what leaves your actual um, etch on, on the uh, photopolymer. Okay, next one. Right, you need an etching press now. Now, if you've got around about 12,000 pounds uh, plus delivery, you can buy this wonderful thing here, which is uh, which will do your prints 24 by 48 inches. Um, 
you need a pretty big room as well. Uh, but when you're a pauper like me, uh, we go to the next one, and this is mine. Um, it's just a small etching press. Typically, they're about a thousand pounds, including VAT. I paid a lot less for mine because I bought it about seven years ago. So um, prices have just rocketed since then. So you can also, um, if you've got college nearby that uh, that will uh, allow, then you you can use college, which is the, the one I used when I made my first uh, solar plates. So after developing the plate, it's dried and inked up. And then we look at this, we've got uh, wow. uh, the actual um, deck of the um, etching press. Then we have a layer of an acetate layer, which has got the, uh, we'll see that in the next, but there's an acetate layer for, for locating all your, um, for your papers and your bitmap. Sorry, your papers and your plate. Then you, then you have your plate, your printing paper. I put a few sheets of um, newsprint over the top to protect the, uh, the blankets, and then that goes through the uh, through the press. Next one. So typically, the green area is your press bed, and this is just a piece of clear acetate. So we would lay our plate down in the center, our ink plate into the center, and then our paper on top of it, and then it will go through the press. Okay, next. So inking the plate, um, the unetched areas of the plate are shown in, in blue uh, and the etched areas are in cyan and the plastic card at the bottom. If we go to the next one, we'll see it when the plate's actually inked. So we'll have a surface layer of ink, which needs to be wiped off the plate. And we use this, this stuff called tarlatan, which is um, uh, a coarse kind of cheesecloth type stuff. So we go to the next one, we've wiped the plate now, but unfortunately where that large area is, you've wiped the ink out of the plate and that's called open bite. So you've, what you have to do is ensure that you don't get open bite by having the correct bitmap positive. Now, if we go to the next one, you'll see all those, those lines of, uh, of blue now, which are the white specks, and they act as if you like, like pillars, which stop the, the ink being wiped out. That's why when we looked at the, um, the, the images before and you saw some black speckles, uh, white speckles in the back areas, uh, that is what they help do. And I'll, this can be illustrated a little better if we go to the next one. So we've got um, our continuous term positive there, smoking Joe. And next one. What we're going to do, this, this positive now has had a correction of curve applied. And you'll notice how much lighter it is. And the reason for this is we're putting some lighter areas, some of these white dots, into the blacks. So Correction curves now applied. We'll, we'll examine the pipe area now. So we'll go to the next one. This is the continuous tone, and you can see the bowl of the pipe is black. The bottom of the pipe, lots of black. And then we've got our, our whites and greys in between. Now, we have to ensure that we get enough white into the black areas to hold the ink and stop out and bite. Now, on the next one, You can see that's what the, the bitmap positive will look like. And you can see now in the, the bowl of the pipe and at the bottom of the pipe, you've got lots of dots of white and they will stop the ink from being wiped out of the, um, out of the plate and stop open bite. If we compare it to a, a poor bitmap, now this is a poor bitmap positive that's been used on this one. And you'll see that the pipe is still black. We've got 
dots in all the other areas, but the, the bowl and the bottom of the pipe remain black. So when you wipe your plate, that's going to be wiped out and it's going to be a dirty uh, gray color and you won't get pure black. Okay, next. So I don't know whether you want to ask some questions now or whether you want to go through the, um, just through the practical thing. Let's say, let's, uh, let's go ahead and do some questions. No questions? You're still able to still able to hear me, Dan or Dave? I can still hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. we can hear you. I, I had a question <laughs> about the stochastic screen. When would you expose that if you did use a screen? When would you expose it if you use the screen? Yeah. Um, basically, you just expose the continuous tone positive, and then immediately afterwards, you expose the stochastic screen on top of it. So basically what you're doing, you're putting a matrix of um, uh, white dots into the barriers to stop the open by. So the, the matrix of white dots will go into the black and the gray areas uh, to stop the open bite. I think the way it's done with, and I'm not, I don't know enough about the um, copper plate versions, but I believe they do it with what they call equity power. I mean, the stochastic screen is sometimes known as an aquatint screen. But when, you, when you're using the copper plate, I believe it goes into an aquatint box, which contains a very fine powdery resin. And that lands on the, uh, the plate and then it's heated. So these um, time pieces of resin melt and they form what they do what a stochastic screen would do. And I think. Um, uh, you can use other methods as well. I think there's uh, there's liquids you can buy now, but I've not really gone into that side of it, and I don't know an awful lot about the uh, the copper plate method. Um, I have a question, Dave. Um, when you produce your bitmap positive through Photoshop, you determine the grain size of your image correct by the, the pixel resolution of your bitmap, is that correct? Yeah, it, I would, on this one, you'll see. Um, and and let, me, let me ask the question a different way because I have two photograph viewers here at home. One was made back in about 1905, which shows a lot of grain. It's actually an Edward Curtis photograph. I have another one that was made in about 1928, which shows virtually no grain at all. And yet they're both photographers. Yeah, I think it's the way. I don't know whether stochastic screens were available back then. They might well have been done with um, with, with aquatint powder, uh, which is melted on, as I said. Now I guess you you can get really fine powder, or you can get not so fine powder. And my guess would be that. One of them had a, a super fine powder and the other one didn't. But that's only a guess. Yeah, and relating that so, to, to today's practices, though, like I said, you could, I assume you could determine the grain size in the pixel resolution of your bitmap image from Photoshop. Yeah, that's right. Um, tend to find that if you go over 300, um, it doesn't work so well. If you go go below that, you tend to find it. It's a very grainy looking image. You, you've got quite a lot of. Um, it, it looks pixelated if you if you go down to say say 150. So I, I normally just stick with the image at 300 and and the actual bitmap at 300. Go ahead, Ivan. No, I'm sorry. Uh, just uh, no, I'm sorry. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Any other any other questions before we get into how he does the the bitmap in Photoshop? All right. Uh, okay. Let's go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and we'll move through the the bit, bitmap pretty quickly so we can get to your actual presentation video showing showing everything yeah. you do okay. there. I mean, this this if you're publishing it afterwards, you can take it and read through it as well. So open your image. Uh, one important thing, size your image at this stage. If we go to the next one, uh, the, the stuff I, I'm using um, PureTech, uh, questions just popped up. I'm using PureTech and I have used, um, or the one from Holland, uh, I can't remember its name now, it'll come to me sooner or later. Um, yeah, so so we go image, image size, and there you'll see, uh, um, this is for a 10 centimeter square miniature at 300 ppi. So next one, uh, we go image mode grayscale, we need to turn it to grayscale or so it won't, it won't be able to be turned to a bitmap. So this is actually ticked on um, RBG. So just click onto grayscale. Okay. Now we need the adjustment curve. So we go image adjustments curves. Get the next one. A curve dialog opens. So we, we click on this tiny little icon by the OK. And click on that. And this box comes up, which is um, save or load um, preset. So we'll load one on the next one. And I'm loading this one, which is photopolymer curve one and load. Okay. We call it a curve. This is really a chopped off. Um, it's a chopped off line. We've chopped the black off and the tiny bit of the white. There are some very sophisticated ways of, of making curves for these things. And I've tried them and I spent about 50 pounds on um, Toyobo plates. And I found they were no better than, than this um, silly curve for the ones of a better description. Um, so I'll stop with this. And then we finally go um, image mode bitmap. Click on that. Okay. And then you can see inputs 300, change your output to 300 if you need to, and then click on diffuse dither. Okay. And then that's your, your bitmap positive done. And you, as you can see there, there's plenty of white dots into the, the black areas. So we won't get an open bite. Okay, next. Um, this is the, the video bit practical bit. Firstly, materials. This is the plastic card, which is the base for housing the photopolymer. This is a piece I prepared earlier. Now you, you have to sandpaper this with an extremely fine sandpaper. That's in order to put a key onto the, the plastic, which helps lamination. Uh, we then use some alcohol to clean it to ensure every bit of grease is off there. Once that's dried off, we now need to look at the photopolymer. Now this is the photopolymer. Three layers. Protective layer, top, bottom, with the photopolymer in the middle. Now when we put this on, we know which side to take off first, because there's a curve. And what you do is take off this inside of the curve, and that is then laminated to the plastic card. But first, we need to spritz the card with a little water. That just helps everything move around properly. 
So, take a little bit of sticky paper, sticky tape, and this is the tricky bit. Just trying to get it peeled off. Now it'll start to come away. And as you can probably see there now, we're removing that bottom layer. So there we go. We pop the photopolymer on like so. And now we use a roller to get all the air out and all the water. Now we just need to trim it. There we have it, we'll just give it another final roll to ensure it's flat and everything's in contact. Okay, so that's all the water out and the next stage is simply using a hair dryer or a drying cupboard if you have one and give it about five minutes not too hot. If the dryer is too hot you can buckle and warp the plastic card. So that's the first stage. Um, this now, um, once, once dried, we'll have a look at uh, how the next uh, steps go. Right, the next step we're going to expose the sandwich so firstly we place it on our exposure frame. We take our positive acetate. Now this is a side it's been printed on. We want that to the photopolymer. This is so there's no thickness of uh, acetate. Place on our top brass. This will print the wrong way round, but once the plate goes in and is inked and goes into the etching press, it'll be round the right way. So now this goes into the exposure unit under UV and my timings are about 30 to 35 seconds for this, this type of uh, image. Be different for everybody, uh, we've all got different exposure units, um, so you'd have to experiment and do some, uh, some tests. Okay, so that's the end of the second stage. Okay, so that's now been exposed, the bulldog clips removed and the cover glass. So we'll take away the bitmap positive, tuck it away over there, and then what we need is a little bit of tape again. Let me just pick it. Now you can see it's starting to come away. So the mylars come off and this then goes into the developer. Here's the developed and dried plate. I should have mentioned that the developer is a 1% sodium carbonate solution. 
timing I usually leave it in the um, developer for around eight minutes but every two minutes I just give it a, a give the tray a little tilt and move it around just to get rid of uh, the poly photopolymers that are sitting in the grooves. Now I don't know whether you can see the etch on that. This is now ready for the next stage which is inking and printing. Right before ink inking we must firstly decide how large an addition is required. If we're making say an addition of 10 we need to prepare around 15 sheets of paper. We need a few artist proofs and a few for contingencies. Unlike photographic paper, the printmaking convention is to tear the paper rather than cut it. A uh, simple rule like this can be used uh, and tear down the straight side or if you like a deckled edge, use a deckled edge ruler and just tear it like so. So we've got a nice deckled edge. This is Hannah Muller etching paper and what we would do, do next is the, the sheets would be soaked uh, for 10 minutes all the surface water blotted off and then they are kept between blotting paper and put into a plastic bag so that they are kept soft. The reason for soaking them is to make the paper more supple so when it goes through the etching press it actually punches into those grooves. So hopefully we'll come out with a unit like that with a nice border around. So next stage inking. Right so now to the inking. We've got some 1796 ink here. And this is our rubber spreader, so we take some of this. Spread it across the plate. Certainly I'd recommend gloves because you're getting a terrible mess doing this. Okay, so now we've got the ink worked in, we now have to take it off. So we use some of this stuff, Tarleton. Now this will take some, some time, probably three or four minutes to get the ink off. So I won't bore you with that, I'll come back in a couple of minutes. OK, so the last few wipes of the plate, you can now see the image quite clearly. Um, we just use a little bit of uh, telephone book paper. Just give it a little polish and you can just... Now, important is wiping the edges, so we need to take, take it by the edges. I'll try and get it from the camera. You can see the way we're taking off the ink that's down the sides, which will make a little bit of a mess of the print. So. So you get the edges nice and clean. 
and then just get the final wipe over. And I think we're ready to go now. Okay, so this is the etching press, and here we have our piece of acetate so we can locate the plate and the printing paper. So first off we're going to drop the plate on. It's fairly not quite. Right, so we've got the plate in position. Now we're going to pop on the paper. Um, grubby hands, so we use a little bit of uh, spare paper to put it into place. This is tricky because I'm working around a tripod as well. That looks about okay. So now we pop on a few sheets of newsprint. Fold down the blankets and away we go through the press. Nice and slowly. Now we're going to know if it's worked or it hasn't. Okay, so we'll peel it off. And there we go. I would probably, this is the first uh, run off this plate, so I would probably um, run a, a sheet of plain paper through first and then re ink, but that gives you an idea of the principle. Awesome. All right. So yeah, I would say uh, any additional questions. That was that was amazing, Dave. Oh, so actually, I have one question. Um, I'm assuming that you soak that paper, uh, the receptor paper, that that's not going through dry. Sorry, say again, Austin. I, I said I'm. Ex I'm a, do you soak the receptor paper, um, or does that go, or do you use dry paper for the transfer? No, no. no. Um, for this process, you absolutely need to use uh, soak paper. Um, soak for 10 minutes, and the sheets are usually uh, put between two, two sheets of blotting paper. So if you've got 15 sheets for your addition, you would then put them in a polythene bag so they don't dry out. And it's basically to keep the, the paper ultra soft so it punches into the, um, into the grooves and the etches on the um, plate. Unlike uh, oil print transfer or bromoil transfer, um, the, probably the, the wetting of the paper isn't quite as important because you're not pushing it into any grooves, you're just trying to pull the ink off the paper. So um, I think Kirk does it both ways. He sometimes dampens his uh, his print, and I know you you've just spritzed yours quite um, not too liberally, and uh, it, that's worked as well. So I think it's a case of um, suck it and see. 
Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I just had a, a quick question, uh, Dave. Thanks very much, Dave. That was really, really good. Superb, uh, superb explanation, I thought. What, how would you do it if you didn't have um, a bitmap from a computer? Um, stochastic screen. So you have to, okay. So that, okay, and you've been through that. Okay, all right, thanks. Did I say there was a, a, a name Mitchell crop up there? Carl is Mitchell. He's not there anymore. I'm sure I saw the name Carl Mitchell or Mitchell. Um, this guy, you want to look at his, if it, if it is the guy I'm thinking it is, you look at his, um, his copper photographers. They're stunning. Yeah. Absolutely stunning. I had a quick question uh, and Thank you, Dave, uh, from one Dave to another. <laughs> um, yeah. When you were inking the plate, uh, I, I'm a complete amateur when it comes to bromoils, but I'm wondering if that's a point, what would it look like if instead of using a roller and then um, removing ink until it was appropriately inked, what if you hammered it on with a boar's hairs brush at that point? You mean onto, onto the fetch polymer plate? Yeah. Um. You can put it on any number of ways. You can use little bits of card. I suppose you could you could hit the plate with a bromar brush, uh, but ultimately you need to get the ink into those grooves. And I think the best way is to push it in with one of those those rubber spreaders, and then you have to take it off. I'm I'm not sure whether you get enough ink in if you if you just uh, hit it with a bromar brush. Um, I certainly wouldn't go down that route. I would just just use a rubber um, that rubber spatula, you know, to put it into the grooves. Well, normally it's also that's how it worth. Um, right. It was it was you if you'd have noticed on the video, it was a bit jerky the video. But if you'd have noticed, uh, it was quite a difficult job getting the ink out of that plate. Uh, what I would would have, should have done. Uh, which I usually do is have a dish warmer under the uh, under the actual um, plate, uh, and that then allows the ink to be a lot softer and spread a lot easier. You can do a lot quicker then. I, I think when I've done bromoil, I've spread like you did, and then subtractively, basically, uh, uh, you know, I've used a speedball roller and then uh, foam rollers to pull off, and then uh, hammered finer. So yeah, I know it takes forever at that point. I guess I'm more curious aesthetically what it would do if, if anything or whether uh, it wouldn't take in a, in a way that looks any different. Uh, one of the interesting things that I, I want to try, what I'm going to do sometime or other is with Bromo, we, we're talking Bromo now, is actually use a bit negative uh, as the, uh, for the Bromo oil and see how that looks using the bitmap uh, as a negative and making a bromoil from it. So I'm not quite sure how that will come out, but it's, uh, it's just one of those fun things to try. And uh, Davey, I'll, I'll just say real quick, um, I don't know if this is in any interest, but what I'm planning to do is actually ink up a bromoil, then take a photo of that bromoil and then create the photopolymer plate of the final bromo oil that then I can then run multiple prints of, you know, because I've been doing transfer and it just, it takes so long to ink up and um, and then there's the terror of running it through the machine and whether or not it's going to take or not. So uh, this seemed like a, a good way to reproduce bromo oils um, consistently. I'll see, where uh, yeah. you, I'll see exactly where, you, where you're coming from. Um, but in terms of value, or if you're going to sell them or sell an addition, I think the gravure taken from your normal negative or your normal negative 
and your normal print uh, and make a gravure of it, I think that would be just as valuable as photographing the bromoil and doing a, a, but it'd be brilliant to see exactly how they come out. It'd be quite an interesting exercise. I think we're all mad, basically. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, if we can add another layer of complexity, why not? That's uh... a... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we do, do da all these daft things, don't we? You know, we've, we've got wonderful cameras, wonderful lenses, and we botch everything up by, you know, sticking bottled glass on the front and, and making bromoles and doing stupid things. But, you know, it keeps us out of mischief. <laughs> yes. I didn't ask about color. I'm not that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that, that, that's another one that if, if you go to the YouTube channel that we have, there's a, a great talk by uh, Dan uh, a couple of a months ago, and he gets into some color stuff. Uh, but Megan, I uh, see your hand up there. Thanks. Hi, thanks so much, Dave. Um, I, I work in Photograph here and I have a dark room. I'm up in Alberta, Canada. Um, it was really interesting to uh -huh. see your approach and everything as you go through it, because even after doing um, photopolymer gravure for over three years, there's just so many nuances and there's so many different ways of approaching it. So it's it's quite interesting. Um, one of the comments I wanted to make is on the large size. So for us in Canada, the Aquatint screens, we actually can't even get them in Canada. We order them from the States. And then for the plates, the Toyobo plates, what I find is... Um, our best value is getting A2. We put in a group order from the one place in Toronto that carries them. But you're right, the guillotine, like cutting them down, even though I have access to a print shop with an industrial uh, guillotine for cutting plates, copper and the steel plates, um, it warps the edge. And so I'm constantly having issues with losing margin of the plate. And so I have to factor yeah. that into um, kind of you know, like what I'm going to lose out of the, like cutting down a large plate. And then when I move into smaller plates that are pre-cut, um, the issue is some of them are thinner and they bend when you're inking, if you're not careful, or they, um, they're just more expensive because they're pre-cut. So it's, it's a constant thing that like, you know, even after years later, I'm still looking at different options and evaluating kind of the, uh, our <laughs> um, but the guillotine part is is a major it's just an ongoing challenge I find for all of us that are using this process um yeah. I did have one question which I I'm so curious about so when you were showing your video when you were inking you had this it looks like an acetate holder with a ridge that holds your plate in place yes yes can you please tell me about that <laughs> it looks looks like a great well it, it's um it's basically um a piece of wood with some plastic glued on top of it, and then some thin strips of plastic down the left and the bottom, if you like. And then if you one white a second, I can bring it up and show you. That's amazing. The way the way that a lot of us are ink plates are, if it's if they're big, that is obviously not going to work. But to have a small plate and be able to control it like that is a lot easier to control the ink and your fingers and everything. So. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. I guess he went to go like literally. Yeah. Dead. Sorry, my question <laughs> just took him away. <laughs> well, he's gone though. Can I ask? So, are most of you in a bromoil? Like, this is an ongoing bromoil group that you run, and then this is okay. yeah. So, yeah, a gentleman named Tony uh, created the the brome oil and oil group. Um, okay. And then a couple of months ago, I kind of kicked off this like monthly call, which started off just kind of talking shop. And then I was like, well, let's start to share some process. So mm -hmm. uh, there was a great presentation on Rollins oil. And so that, so I've started kind of looking into that. And then I knew that Dave had his uh, photopolymer gravure. So now that some of y'all have joined the brome oil and oil group, I will be pestering some of y'all to also, uh, possibly put together a presentation on your own process. Uh, the goal is really just to create these presentations that we can all turn to because I would not have learned any of the stuff that I have learned without YouTube and random books. Well, that's great. Right, Thanks for putting the, it together. This is, <laughs> this is the plight for inking. I don't know whether we can get a close up on that. Um. 
There we go. Okay, so did you make this yourself, like with wood and? Yeah, basically it's just a piece of wood with some plastic on the top. Yeah. And two thin sheets of plastic down either side, so. Yeah. So it stops the plant from moving around. So is it like an acetate um, or plexiglass that you no, it's, like glued? It's, um, it's just it's just glued on plastic. Yeah. Okay. Um, Perfect. But if you're using Toyobo plates, then your best bet, in my opinion, and it works a treat, is you can buy plastic. Uh, you can buy um, a magnetic um, sheet. Mm. Glue that down onto your, your um, onto a piece of wood, and then the plate. In fact, you have a job job getting it off because it sticks uh, like anything, you know. And, and um, you won't move it when you're inking it because it's it's got such a pull. You just need to look for some um, some magnetic three um, uh, M's make it, and uh, you just glue it onto the the wooden plate onto your wood. And um, it just just grabs the steel plates. That's perfect. Thank you. I'll I'll definitely try that. That's a that's something that could definitely help my my process. Um, I also had one other one other quick question um, on just your so everything we've been doing here is with vacuum bags to get really really like kind of um, pressured perfect seal of our positives and aquatint screens against the plate. Um, mm -hmm. are, have you had any issues using? You're using like a contact printing frame. Um, have you tried that with a like compared to a vacuum bag, or have you had good results with with either? I've, or I've used, yeah, I've used a vacuum um, plate once, a vacuum machine, um, and they work great. But because uh, when I'm working from home, I I haven't got that kind of facility. So um, by printing the the bitmap and putting the printed side to the photopolymer. Uh, you've got no, you've got no thickness of acetate to go through. Um, I found that's the other reason I use the uh, Ultra Vitalux lamp, is that when I put it under a very diffuse UV source like the flycatcher tubes, you tend to get a little bit of bleed over, and you don't get quite as good a, a sharpness on the uh, on the dots. Uh, the Ultra Vitalux lamp, being a point light source. Uh, concentrates the light more in a downward way rather than um, spreading as the um, UV tubes do. So that's why I went that route and it, it tends to be okay and I've had no problems working with just a, a frame. Great, thank you so much for that. Cool. All right. Any other questions? Austin, can I ask for you to paste the YouTube channel link if those other videos are available for the uh, Rollins, uh, if, if those talks are online? Yeah, definitely. I will uh, let me post that in the chat real quick. Or actually, did, did you join the group? The, yeah, the is it group? in there on Facebook? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'll go, I'll go back and just repost it. Um, into the group um, so that it's easier to access for everybody. Um, yeah, I think there's maybe four four calls in there so far. Um, and then if any of you know anyone who's working in Media Brom and uh, has a process that they wanna share, that's what all of us are kind of itching to see right now. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the big topics. Any other? Any other questions before we call it a day? All right. Thank you for organizing Dave. this. What an incredible resource. Yeah, Dave, thanks so much for such a thorough presentation, man. Uh, what started out as a bunch of us just kind of shooting the shit about um, doing bro oil and oil work has kind of started to turn into a, what, I, what I hope will be a valuable resource for all these kind of uh, unknown processes that we have to learn from each other. Um, so yeah, look forward to interacting with you on, uh, on the group. Please post some of your work, starts to share some experience with us. Um, we don't have a lot of people doing photo group here. So, uh, Megan, you have some stuff, uh, love to see it. Uh, 
basically keeping it all to anything that's oil related. Um, so trying to cast as wide of a net there as we can. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll find out what the what next month will, will be. We, I'm trying to do these on the first Saturday of every month at the same time, uh, which is 10 a.m. Mountain Time for me in Denver, Colorado, um, to, to make it as, as repeatable as possible, which is why I didn't want to cancel, even though I'm out of town right now. Um, so we'll see what the next topic is. I might reach out to some of you. Uh, so prepare yourselves. Have a good conference, Austin. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye. All right. Bye.